I'd like to welcome everyone to this session entitled Realizing Mission Possible, Decarbonizing Heavy Industry. My name is Anthony Hobley, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mission Possible platform. This session is part of the high-level Climate Champions Race to Zero November Dialogues in the lead up to the COP in the lead up to COP26 next year. It is also part of the Climate Action Drumbeat, a series of events that have been organized by the Mission Possible Platform and others, um, an initiative by the World Economic Forum in partnership with the Energy Transitions Commission. A key purpose of this session is to examine major obstacles and possibilities for moving forward on achieving sector agreements by the COP26 in Glasgow next year that will set heavy industry and mobility sectors on the pathway towards net zero emissions by 2050. We have an extremely competent panel of industry leaders and experts to help us explore this theme and hopefully give us some good and actionable recommendations. To make our session even more dynamic, we also have invited a digital scriber, um, Luciana Fabiani, who will illustrate and capture some of the key discussion points visually today. There will also be a lot of social media. Please use uh, the hashtags Mission Possible and Race to Zero. We encourage you to get the word out from this event. Now, without further ado, it is my greatest pleasure um, to hand over to Jules Hortenhorst, um, who is the CEO of the Rocky Mountain Institute. We quite frankly couldn't be in better hands, Jules. Thank you very much, Anthony. And uh, let me add my welcome and good morning, afternoon, evening uh, to those words from Anthony. When I think about a race to zero, when I think about a race, it's all about speed. And in many sectors, we have tremendous momentum. In renewable electricity, uh, uh, renewables are scaling up around the world and replacing fossil fuels. In electric vehicles, we're starting to see uh, EVs outcompeting the internal combustion engine. But we all of the industry and heavy transport sector are the slightly less accomplished athletes. We're probably a little bit more like I am, uh, somewhat hurting knees, uh, not every day out there to run and therefore a bit slower to get started. But we're still part of this race and it is incredibly important as the video at the beginning of this session laid out that we catch up. The industry dialogue today brings together the leaders of heavy industry and heavy transport, government and civil society together to mobilize concrete action on how to accelerate the net zero industry transition scale up commitments and keep up the momentum and the drumbeat to maximize progress and tangible outcomes by COP26 in November of next year. The industry transition is starting to happen, but we need action at scale. And we must in the run up to COP26 move forward and set very measurable, very tangible net zero commitments for all of the heavy industry and transport sectors. And we need to do that in conjunction with the policy, the energy and the technology solutions that are needed to reach that goal. That's why these race to zero and mission possible platform dialogues are so important. That's why the work of Anthony and his team is so important. Uh, and that's why we're engaging all of you here today. We have a fantastic panel uh, this, uh, this morning for me. Uh, I'm very pleased to introduce, um, first and foremost, Faustine de La Salle. Uh, she is a partner at Systemic and the director of the Energy Transitions Commission uh, from the UK and France. Um, then we have on the line Bo Sarah Simonson, who is the CEO of Maersk McKinney Muller um, Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. And uh, Bo has a very impressive background in uh, shipping and the technologies around shipping for a very long time. And in a few minutes, we will also be joined by Harry Brekelmans, who is a director for projects and technology of Royal Dutch Shell in the Netherlands. Harry is wrapping up another meeting, uh, but will be here shortly. Bo, let me start with you, um, because you are very much in the middle of this debate. Maersk has been at the leading edge of this. The Getting to Zero Coalition that, that Maersk has been spearheading is a powerful example of an alliance 
of more than, I think, more than 120 companies now that have agreed to a common goal for carbon neutral vessels on the water by 2030. And by agreeing to this goal, uh, you have uh, converted the ambition that Maersk already set some time ago into real concrete action. Can you tell us a little bit what in your mind was the um, critical success factors behind getting the whole industry to move on this? How is momentum building and why is this happening so uh, significantly in the shipping industry? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, session today. It's, uh, it's, indeed, uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be part of this, uh, be part of this uh, very powerful network uh, where we uh, lay out and discuss uh, the future pathways of accelerating the transition. Uh, as you rightly said, uh, I'm from uh, shipping and I'm originally from uh, Maersk and and Maersk has joined uh, the Getting to Zero Coalition and, and has also been uh, taking the initiative to set up the um, Maersk McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping, which I am heading. And I think the point is, the starting point for this is that there is a general acknowledgement in shipping that we need to be part of the solution, hard to abate or not, we see a responsibility to be part of the solution, to set ambitious targets, and uh, to set in motion concrete activities to actually start uh, understanding the pathway forward and actually starting uh, that transition. And the Getting to Zero Coalition is all about that. That is really to create a robust understanding of what the future looks like and to set in motion concrete activities to support such a strategy. And the center, uh, the Merch McKinney Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping that I'm heading uh, is, uh, is about basically the same objective and therefore we're collaborating very closely with the Getting to Zero Coalition. I think the acknowledgement, uh, the widespread acknowledgement in the industry is well reflected in the strategy that has been adopted in IMO and shipping uh, as a sector is fortunate to have global regulation through the UN uh, International Maritime Organization. And therefore it's very uh, powerful and it's, it's a very positive that IMO has laid out a strategy now to decarbonize the entire sector. IMO has many times in the past shown that it is possible to regulate effectively globally and this time around as well. So the objective, the ambition is well reflected there. And we are seeing very concretely that there are a number of levers that we need to mobilize in order to get this transition going. And first of all, uh, those levers are in the energy and the technical space. And we are seeing, as, as you said in the introduction, that sustainable energy sources are scaling up and we're seeing opportunities emerging both for creating energy types that we can take on board the ships and also for having the technologies on board the ships so that we can handle these uh, in, a safe, uh, in a safe manner. We do believe that these energy and technical options need to be supported strongly by uh, regulatory, financial and commercial levers. And fortunately, we're seeing great developments in those uh, three areas as well that will support uh, the transition in shipping. I think, I think we need to be uh, honest about the fact that if we are to meet the targets put forward by the scientific community, we are in a great hurry and we need to basically move faster uh, than the trends we're seeing at the moment. So uh, I think in, in shipping, uh, as we're seeing in other sectors as well, we really have a task of getting the clarity and getting the levers mobilized to actually uh, get concrete um, in, in the efforts of decarbonization. So I'm very happy to work with Getting to Zero and I'm very happy to lead now the establishment of the Merce McKinney Muller Center Institute uh, those two initiatives are all about understanding how we can accelerate uh, the sector transformation. 
very happy to be here, very happy to talk much more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. And um, I have one follow-up question. And that is the following. Um, you, you emphasize the importance of collaboration and, and that is crystal clear. Um, you've also highlighted the role of the IMO. But in my assessment, there's another factor that has made uh, a significant impact on the progress uh, that we've seen in the, in the sector. And that is individual leadership of a company that sort of takes the bull by the horns, as they say, and steps forward. And, and I can ask you this question because you've only just recently joined Maersk, but talk a little bit about the role that you believe the leadership of Maersk as a company specifically has played in assembling this coalition. I think uh, that's exactly right. And I think there's a growing acknowledgement that it's not a matter of just waiting for regulations to shape up and start driving the industry. So we're seeing companies now stepping forward, really wanting and actually taking leadership to drive this forward. And leadership in this regard means creating clarity uh, in the strategy going forward, taking action within own space, and uh, establishing uh, various forms of collaboration that will actually bring together uh, other leaders uh, from other parts of the supply chain willing to take, to spend resources on understanding how to move forward and actually starting uh, to make it happen. So I think that's what we've seen with Maersk. That's what we're seeing with other companies joining Getting to Zero, joining uh, the center that I am uh, now leading. And I have to say, it's always the chicken and the egg uh, in a transition. And, and uh, I think this time we, we have to rely on significant industry players really stepping forward. So this is what these initiatives are about because it, 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 it also has to be very robust and very thought through activities when uh, we ask uh, the big industry players to, to step forward. So it's really also about uh, preparing the groundwork very well so that those steps become extremely effective in driving uh, this forward. So we don't have to do a lot of rework and so on. So I think that's, that's really a part of the exercise to create a framework uh, and a clarity without going into analysis paralysis where everything stops because we have to do re more research. So I think that's what we're seeing now. And I think that's a really powerful trend uh, that we're seeing fortunately amongst uh, several companies, leading companies. Uh, Super, thank sector. you both. Talking about leading companies, let me switch and Harry allow me to put you on the spot. Um, the oil and gas industry is, of course, a big part of the challenge, but also is going to play a crucial role in the solution. And at Shell, you guys have uh, recently announced your ambition to become a net zero emissions company uh, by 2050 or even sooner. Uh, talk to us about uh, how Shell is thinking about this internally, but I'd also love to hear your perspective on how you see yourself working together with industries like the shipping industry and with companies like Maersk to drive the sort of collaborative effort that Bo was describing? Yeah, first of all, hi, uh, Jules. Good to see you. Um, and thanks very much for the, for the kind invite. And uh, also my regards to the other panelists, really privileged to, to be here. Um, and then also, uh, you know, wishing all the participants uh, uh, and the audience well. We, uh, I think we live in very challenging times. Um, and uh, and I hope people are are able to navigate through it safely and uh, and and also positively. But to your point, Joe, you know we we also as a company find ourselves in in these challenging times, and it certainly has hit our industry very hard. Um, as a consequence, we we have taken and made some rather significant interventions this year uh, with respect to the company's balance sheet and our ability to to navigate through these times uh, in a resilient manner. Um, and, and of course, much of that kind of plays out in the near term. Uh, it has direct impact uh, on what we do, um, starting first and foremost with making sure we keep our people safe and we can continue to supply our customers with the, with the products they want. Um, 
but we we didn't stop there. I think it was very important for us, uh, as you pointed out, Jill, that in April we we also made the announcement and expressed our ambition to become a net zero carbon energy business by 2050 together with our customers. We felt it was a very important announcement to make. Um, whereas, of course, a lot of our effort and a lot of the eyes of, of the world focused on the current pandemic, but also with that signaling that there is a long term here uh, and that perhaps and even we can use the current situation to come out of, out of it more strongly uh, and then actually return on a path that, uh, that accelerates towards a different society in a different economy. Uh, and so for us, very important to say we feel strengthened uh, and we, we confirm our commitment to a net zero carbon journey uh, in the midst of this challenging moment. Um, and, and so your point around what are you doing as a company, uh, I think plays into that to the extent that even today, as you, I hope, would have expected, many of our people around the world are, are working to, uh, to serve customers within the same time or at the same time. Um, ensure that we are managing operational emissions uh, and continue to abate these uh, on an ongoing basis and accelerate that process. And so when you think about what's happening in Australia and operations in, in Singapore and our refinery and chemical complex here in the Netherlands, in Qatar, in the US, every day people are, shell, are working to manage and reduce our own scope and one or two, uh, scope one and two operational emissions. And of course that is a found foundational premise that needs to continue and is continuing even in the current times. At the same time, we are in the process of, of providing our customers increasingly with lower carbon products. So, so when you look across the business, whether that is an increasing share of biofuels, more options for our customers to uh, be provided with electrical charging in our retail stations, um, our uh, ventures in solar and wind energy, investing significantly and increasingly in the provision of, of low or no carbon electricity. So as a company, we are increasingly and significantly investing in lower carbon products. And of course, that is what needs to happen to be able to get to that net zero aspiration. But I think, Gilles, uh, what you are pointing at is, is that if you think about that going forward in the context of the challenge that the world is facing, that isn't going to be enough. Uh, and I think I heard Bo say it, it, it's, you know, we are not going fast enough. There is an enormous urgency, especially now. Uh, and so what we've come to realize for some time is we cannot do this by ourselves. Uh, and so I think the, the word collaboration uh, rings true. And I think the word across sectors also rings true. So you can look at a company like ourselves uh, and maybe frame it within the, the space of the energy industry or maybe even more narrowly, um, the oil and gas industry and say, well, you need to decarbonize it, that's correct. But we would also say uh, we cannot do that by ourselves or if we would do it by ourselves, we wouldn't attain the scale and the pace that we need to, to get the world to, to meeting the, the Paris commitments or even go beyond that. So, so the frame we're providing or the frame we're suggesting is one to say, you really need to uh, lock arms and think about decarbonization across sectors. And sectors, as you know, go across companies, they go across industries, they go across borders. Um, and so collaboration then becomes enormously important and not only between companies, um, but actually also between governments, companies, consumers, and, and if you want more broadly, civil society. Uh, and said, so that on the one that speaks to the opportunity, but it also of course highlights the challenge because then the, the question becomes, how do you do that then? Because in some ways you could say it's challenging enough for Shell in its own right to decide on investments in low carbon products in developing the technologies and find find that path in other ways, but to do it together with others is perhaps even more challenging. And I think our point would be yes, on the one hand it is, at the same time, we see and embrace the, the opportunity. Um, so where does that apply? Uh, and where do we see that opportunity? Well, not in a small way in the, in the hard to abate sectors. Uh, and so when you think about uh, transport, 
when you think about shipping, when you think about aviation, when you think about heavy duty transport, we believe there's a huge opportunity there to, to in a collaborative fashion, uh, to drive for decarbonization. Both spoke to it, and he can probably major on it more than I can. Um, but this is really about us working together in the context of the shipping industry to provide the lower carbon fuels, but that then also in all likelihood needs different engines, different ship designs, and of course, companies like MERS to, to embrace that and to support it, but also find support from government and customers to be able to afford that big shift. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of, I think, the, 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 the process we are in the midst of uh, and the various coalitions that you see being formed in the context of that. And, and so, so what is key in that regard? I think what, what is key, of course, is, is for us to, to, to be looking through these lenses and to essentially be approaching customers and partners in that regard. And, and there are many examples. Uh, perhaps recently you, you heard of our partnership with Microsoft uh, in their decarbonization. Uh, and of course, that ranges very broadly from you know, their air travel and how we could provide sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, but also decarbonizing the energy use from their data centers. Uh, and you probably wouldn't know it, but, but in, the, in North America, we are one of the largest um, power traders uh, and power providers. Uh, and in fact, we do that uh, to a large extent with renewable power. Uh, and so, uh, and, you know, as a customer and provider, we can really find each other there to provide a far broader lower carbon proposition um, that, that goes well be, be beyond the sort of the traditional sort of bilateral relationship, you, you would have argued. It goes global, uh, but, but it also goes across the many activities that we find ourselves in as, as companies. Um, and maybe to testify to that further, uh, Microsoft recently joined, as you may know, the Northern Lights uh, decarbonization project um, that aims to invest in, the, uh, in carbon capture and sequestration in Norway as a service, bringing together the very elements of the value chain between a big consortium of partners and the Norwegian government in that regard. And, and I think you're really starting to see the emergence of these non-traditional coalitions and these non-traditional comings together uh, of actors that otherwise perhaps would have in interacted in many different ways. And I think it's exactly that that we're going to need in terms of being able to scale up this journey in terms of you know, breadth, and speed, uh, and that's that's exactly what we're going to need. Now, last word on that. Um, that is that is going to require a lot of changes to the way we we interact and operate. Uh, and as a company, we're therefore in the midst of a, a major restructuring uh, to not only um, address the challenges in, in in the pandemic, but also to basically um, redress many of the existing company structures in aligning them with what we need in getting through the energy transition successfully. Uh, so that's one thing. We need to start redirecting um, investment. We're going to have to redirect the way we develop our technologies. Uh, and you and I have spoken about that on, on quite a few occasions. And, and of course, that's actively taking place. And, and then last but not least, our whole interaction, both from a behavioral uh, as well as a sort of an operational perspective with the many partners around us, not in the least people like Bo and his company, but also governments and broader sections of civil society. And I can tell you um, that is not always very easy for us as a company, but, but I'm sure perhaps in you know, the following conversations we, uh, we can come back to that. So, so let me pause here and hand back over to you, Jean. I think you're on mute. Thank you, Harry. And uh, let me, let me, turn to Faustin because Harry has laid out a very compelling argument why we have to complement the government-driven national-centric approach to addressing climate change by this collaborative international sector-driven approach. But that is hugely challenging and it's, and it's significantly hugely challenging because we need to develop the technologies, we need to build the commitments, there's an inordinate amount of work and we're under the time pressure that Bo mentioned. Faustin, you are, um, as director of the Energy Transition Commission, constantly in dialogue with companies who are thinking about this. Tell us what you see as the challenges and the opportunities of creating that dialogue. 
Like what Harry was uh, saying was absolutely music to my ears because I think this is exactly what we're trying to achieve through the work of the Mission Possible platform that we started a year ago with uh, the World Economic Forum and that we're now scaling up with a number of uh, other partners. Um, what I think the, the, the different building blocks that he was describing that are really for a company to feel confident enough to invest in certain technologies and be able to develop them, deploy them, bring them to commercial scale, they need to be in an environment that will be favorable to those investments. And we will only create that favorable environment through collaborations across the value chains and across different sectors. And that's why the Mission Possible platform was created a, a year ago. I think the building blocks that were, he was describing were roughly around those lines. We need the policy right. And I'd say we need two uh, timelines of policy right. We need very specific policies right today to help the first movers uh, who will need support in the next five years to get the first wave of projects off the ground. And then we need longer term policies that will accompany and support the scale up and the deployment of technologies at scale. But those two things are actually of quite different nature. Um, and we, uh, we have found it useful to distinguish between those two uh, timelines of policy making, because we don't want to wait for the longer term stuff to actually be able to support first movers in the next five years. The second uh, element I think he was describing very well is that we need to get the energy input right. And uh, that's particularly important for the heart of the bay sectors because there's a lot of investment required in terms of capex in each of those sectors. But when you look at the overall economics of producing steel zero carbon or running ships zero carbon, the, the bulk of the cost comes from zero emission fuels. And that's why having a shell around the table is so important because we need to get the cost of zero emission energy down, especially for the harder to abate sectors, uh, the cost of hydrogen down. down uh, and that will imply collaboration between suppliers and demanders because the only way we're going to get, get that cost down is through scale and we will only get through to scale if we crack the chicken and egg issue that, that Bo was describing earlier on um, and so we need collaborations between those who can supply that energy and those that really will need that new form of energy to decarbonize to understand how to what pace, we can scale both supply and demand in a coherent way and in a way that actually provides confidence to both parties that they can move forward with their projects. The, to do that though, you really need another piece of the puzzle. Uh, you need demand uh, for zero carbon products and for zero carbon services. I think um, what uh, we've been observing, talking to both the materials uh, industry uh, as well as the long distance transport industries, is that they uh, are very happy and very ready to move to invest in new technologies. Uh, but these technologies at this stage represent an extra cost. So the only way for them to actually move forward is to ensure that somewhere that extra cost is accounted for. And it can come from policy, but it can actually come from uh, consumer good companies. There's a major role for consumer good companies to help the rest of their value chains, their suppliers, uh, to go through decarbonization, because the cost of zero carbon shipping, for instance, is very significant for a ship owner and for a ship operator. But we, if you run it through to what it represents on the cost of a consumer product, let's say a pair of shoes um, or uh, some uh, IT product that is shipped around the world, it's no more than 1% of the total price of that final product. So if we can manage to run that cost through to the end consumer, um, we actually provide a way to uh, those harder to abate sectors to manage the extra cost of zero emissions, of operating zero emissions, and we facilitate investment across the value chain all the way up to the fuel provider. So demand signals and demand from consumers and from consumer good companies is really the third bucket that we really need. And then the final dimension I would add to that is the dialogue with the finance community. 
Uh, the finance community is obviously very diverse with very different levels of risk uh, appetites um, and will need to intervene at different levels of development of the technology. Uh, but I think there's a huge appetite from the finance community uh, exemplified through multiple initiatives that have been created over the past few months to really understand how the harder to abate sectors are going to decarbonize and understand how they can help in partnership with public financiers, in partnership with public development banks and with governments. So those four blocks, policy, finance, demand, and energy inputs are, I think, the blocks that we need to work on together, that we started working on through a range of initiatives, and now we need to speed up. And my take after four years leading the Energy Transitions Commission is that we will only speed up if we create trust among industry leaders. And so what we hope to do with uh, the, the panelists here, that with a much broader community, is create that level of trust that enables us to move at a faster speed. Thank you, Faustin. That makes a lot of sense. It also describes a um, very complex multi-stakeholder um, engagement with a lot of different players with different interests. Um, has the Mission Possible platform um, come up with a way in which this dialogue is going to happen, a, a sort of methodology, one, two, three, four steps of how we're going to get there? We have, and we are trialing it, and we'll probably need to refine it over time. Um, the way we've been describing it is a four-step process. Step number one, bring together all of the most ambitious, really committed industry leaders who want to move together uh, at the value chain level. So bringing in the financiers, bringing in the consumers, bringing in the energy suppliers. Step two, defining with them what the trajectory to net zero emissions looks like. At what pace could we uh, go if we dream big, if we dream uh, fast? Um, and so that goes for a roadmap. I think there's a lot of excellent analysis out there on how do we get to net zero, um, including from the likes of DIEA, uh, who increasingly works on that target. Uh, but what's missing is agreement across the industry leaders on what that trajectory looks like and how fast can we go in the 2020s. I think it's quite easy to understand how what can happen in the 2030s, 2040s. The key question is how fast can we go in the 2020s? Once we've got that roadmap, then it's much easier to encourage um, industry leaders to take bold commitments and to take bold commitments that will be complementary because an industry leader um, let's say uh, a steel manufacturer might feel um, uncomfortable taking a very bold commitment alone. But if they're taking it alongside some of their consumers, some of their financiers, and some of their energy suppliers, then it creates an environment that is much more favorable, where you can believe and you can trust that this commitment will not backfire in the future, because you're actually moving with the rest of the value chain and with the industry leaders in the value chain. And the final step, uh, is to help implementation of those commitments. And that's going into the nitty gritty of how do you make things happen? Uh, so for instance, we're, we're publishing tomorrow with the Global Maritime Forum, a blueprint on how do you de-risk and finance um, uh, first zero emission pilots in the shipping sector. Uh, and that's really getting into the nitty gritty. So I think we need to go through all those four steps, but obviously different sectors are at different stages in that process. And we'll need to adapt also to the specificities of each uh, sector. So work in progress to be refined uh, over the coming months. Thank you, Faustine. I'd love to hone in for a moment on the second step of your, of your process. And, and look specifically at the shipping industry so that we, so we get very tangible for a moment on what does this imply. And Bo, you've, you've done massive thinking and research on what shipping technologies of the future might look like. Uh, so uh, I'd love to ask you, what, what are the perspectives? What are the solutions? Is it biofuel or is it hydrogen or, or what is the magic? And then I'm going to come to you, Harry, and see if, if you agree. So we can play out this second phase right here on the screen in the middle of this session. Bo, over to you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you very much, and and thanks to my fellow panelists. It's it's a very 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 interesting discussion here, and 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 coming from the shipping side, I, I can really agree to the way uh, that the picture is painted here. I think uh, talking now concretely about shipping, first of all, we have to realize that shipping is many different things. Um, so shipping is uh, small, short sea shipping, ferries, for example, running along the coast, it's small coastal vessels, etc., and it's huge ships going in between continents, uh, deep sea. So in a way, we're fortunate that looking at shipping, we have a multitude of different uh, types of operation and, and different types of uh, assets. And uh, from an uh, implementation ease point of view and from an impact point of view, you'll see that the different segments of shipping are placed, are scattered all over uh, this chart. So now when we start talking about which order should we do things, we're fortunate to have actually a segment here where there are low hanging fruits, uh, so to speak. They're not that low hanging, but they are lower hanging than other fruits. Um, the lower hanging ones also tend to be the smaller ones, you know. So, uh, so that's just how it is. So, um, so the thing is that before we get to the deep sea global shipping and to make it even more complex, some of those are trading uh, uh, in a non-regular manner between different region regions, so it's uh, they are not on a on a line of predictive uh, trade, you know. So they go from uh, from Africa to Europe uh, one uh, one time, and then they go to somewhere unknown next time. So so that makes it ultimately difficult to plan support infrastructure for these kinds of ships. But we, before we get to that. We can start with some of uh, the lower hanging fruits, and that could very well be uh, ferries within a country. If you start within a country, then you're fortunate to have uh, predictability around where you need the support infrastructure. And you're even uh, happy to uh, have support probably also from the local government because they have uh, an incentive to to, uh, to work with all uh, the national operations, including the shipping operations. So eventually for some countries, there'll also be a strong uh, financial incentive to actually invest from public sector in decarbonizing operations. So you see, when you're looking at shipping, we can divide it actually into a number of different groups and we can identify areas where it's just easier to get started than in other areas. And I think that, that gives us a lot of guidance. And secondly, I think to what was said before that we have to uh, start thinking in terms of uh, the difficult ones as well. So that means uh, deep sea shipping uh, with tanker, bulk carriers and container ships. And we need to start finding out how we're going to decarbonize those. Definitely, uh, for new builds in the future, what are the future solutions that we'll be aiming for? Uh, and then uh, to make it even more complex, we also need to start thinking about how can we work with the existing fleet uh, and use uh, drop-in uh, fuels and who knows, maybe even CCS to take some CO2 out of the operations of, uh, of existing ships. So uh, then uh, in, in this uh, more difficult but larger impact uh, segments, I think now to your question, what are the solutions for that? I think we're looking at a multitude of uh, opportunities. Uh, we're looking at a, a number of uh, so-called power to X opportunities where we take electrons from solar or wind, for example, and turn them into fuels. And uh, we, we know technically that it's possible to, to produce a number of fuels. You have both, I mean, zero carbon fuels like hydrogen and ammonia. And then you have uh, methanol and other fuels where, where you still produce it from the electrons, but there is a carbon component uh, in them that you either recycle or that you, where you take out the carbon. But, but anyway, and then finally, you have uh, the more heavier fuels, uh, and some of them are from the bio 
biosources. Um, so we, we have a multitude of opportunities in shipping to take the energies on board the ships. And we have already available technologies to actually run on some of those fuels. So today, for example, you will see that we have already ships running on methanol, for example. So that's a proven technology. That's fully possible to do. And we'll see, I mean, soon in the future that we'll have also opportunities to run, for example, on uh, ammonia uh, on, on a larger scale. So we are really seeing these opportunities uh, emerging. And of course, in bringing these forwards, we need to be aware of the very high safety levels that that shipping needs to uh, display. We need to maintain those in the future as well. And it goes without saying that some of these new fuels also need to be matured with regard to the safety uh, elements. And, and for example, ammonia has uh, certain uh, health uh, issues related to them, so that, that needs to be managed. And, and we believe that can be managed, but, but it is important to handle that alongside with the looks to efficiency and, uh, and cost levels. So you, you asked very specifically about the, the technology solutions possible. I think they are definitely, the, the, the technical solutions are definitely going to mature. We're gonna see that emerging. I think uh, what is going to be critical in terms of, uh, of implementation is the question about scalability and availability of the energy sources. Uh, because, uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, really matter if we can run on hydrogen or ammonia produced from renewable energy sources if those renewable energies are not available or in too strong competition with other sectors, you know. So it's, uh, it's really, we really need to understand the bigger picture here uh, and, and make sure that the solutions we're bringing forward for the transition are also available uh, when you look at the global picture and the dynamics between the different uh, sectors. Thank you. And in the meantime, we have a chance to see Lucia's beautiful illustration of this dialogue. Thank you. Uh, Harry, let me come to you. And I'm now on thin ice because you're a Delft engineer and I'm a simple economist. But um, we, we heard Bo argue for really zero carbon fuels um, or methanol with recycled uh, carbons. Uh, in the past, Shell has argued that shipping might be able to leverage the relatively cleaner nature of natural gas. What, what's the emerging view now, given the timeline that we have, and given that we're only going to have one cycle of capital asset turnover ahead of 2050 in the shipping industry, uh, what, what would be the fuel that you guys would argue is the answer for the shipping industry? Yeah, well, <clears throat> great point, Jill, and, and thanks, Bo. I, I think it's a very comprehensive perspective, um, which in my mind reinforces, Jill, that it's very hard to pick a winner. So I, I'm not going to be tempted here. Um, <laughs> but, but what I'm going to draw out more is the, is the points that you and Bo made around, well, I think there's a timing dimension. So there's a, there's a pace and there's a place. So depending on who you are, if you're very operator today there are actually quite a lot of or a few ferry operators who have electrified their uh, their ferries um, so it's done um, or at least you know to the extent they can get access to renewable electricity then then they're there already um, some of our customers who have, have elected to um, to have their their vessels fueled on liquefied natural gas why because it can be done fairly easily and it can be done now uh, and so I think the time dimension here, where choosing for gas today vis-a-vis -vis, uh, perhaps for, for ammonia or hydrogen in 10 years, I think is still an important consideration to make. And I, for one, would not say that, well, then, you know, I, I take your point around the, the, the capital replacement cycles, but, but I'm not so sure the wisdom of saying, well, just wait for hydrogen or ammonia to come, and therefore now we will just continue to emit very high carbon intensity uh, fuels, or we tend to burn high carbon intensity fuels. I'm not so sure yet. So what I would suggest is that we will see a mosaic of solutions emerge uh, in the coming years. And, and, and I, for one, wouldn't want to pick a winner, albeit that I think all the options that Bo uh, identified, I think are actually pretty, pretty good. 
Um, uh, and, and many of these were actually uh, participating or very actively leading the development thereof. So, so, so that's, that's one perspective. The other perspective would be to say, um, how would you make sure that the entirety uh, of that is actually managed in a way that, that allows it to go forward? Uh, and one way we uh, would like to think about it is that um, if you frame all the things that, that Bo offered in a, in a sort of a roadmap for the shipping industry, that would, um, that would get the shipping industry by 50 to a certain aspiration, say net zero, um, then, then that would be a very good way to get all the stakeholders together around a common ambition. Um, so you'd have a, you know, a defined target, um, but, but perhaps you accept that there are different ways to get there. So you would maybe say to the fuel providers like ourselves, what we really would be aiming for is a, an overall fuel offering that has a declining carbon intensity as you go forward. Could be gas to start with, could be biofuels to come in, could be ammonia to follow. Uh, as long as we get there in aggregate, that would be okay. Um, and likewise, then you can have governments provide the appropriate incentives. Because I wanted to come back to a good point that Faustine made, which is that, of course, in the, in the fullness of, of time and across the entirety of the backdrop of a shipping industry, I think, the, and, and the, their customers, the cost can be socialized. Uh, and indeed, decarbonizing, um, you know, the, the logistics around genes would only amount to a few cents per genes. The problem, though, with that is most of the costs are incurred early on and by a relatively small proportion of the players. And frankly, a, a bit like in steel, they cannot afford it. So you really need in that early tra trajectory, not necessarily to pick the winners, but provide the broad stimulus offered through governments or incentives like a carbon price to be able to motivate the appropriate developments, but, but also be able to finance and fund them to basically get through that valley into a place where indeed the scope and the scale and the socialization of the cost is such that indeed it can be turned over against many, many genes and in the fullness of time, mm -hmm. rather than across the early trajectory where I'm just not gonna be able to afford the genes that over the next five years will fund the investments that Bo and I need to be able to get the ships and the fuels there. So I think that, that that's another thing to consider, but that can all be organized around this roadmap. Uh, and we would actually call that roadmap maybe the equivalent of the, the nationally determined contributions. We would call them industry determined contributions or sectorally determined contributions. And that may be a way to frame the, 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 the pathways and the roadmaps we need. Let me hand it back over to you again. Thank you. And, and Faustine, the last question to you then. We've heard both Bo and, and Harry lay out very compelling perspectives, but we need to build consensus around that. How is the Mission Possible platform uh, going to do this? What, what is the mechanism by which we can achieve that consensus? So um, based on our experience within DGC, there are two or three ingredients, actually, that we really need to make it work. The first ingredient is industry leadership. We won't solve that if there's no willingness at CEO level and at chairman level to really engage on that path. And we need leadership, not only in the fuel providers, not only in the harder to abate sectors, but also in the consumer good companies. I think we need more Amazons, more Ikeas, more Apples, who take commitments on the decarbonization of their supply chain to pull the rest of the supply chain with them. And um, so that's the first layer. The second key ingredient for me is data. What those industry players we have around the table have in common is that there are two types of people working in them, engineers uh, and economists, and they both like data. So the way we actually make them agree and converged points of view is to actually discuss the data in depth and make them understand that they're not that far apart in their vision of the world and create bridges that are really based on evidence. And then the final layer is to create trust because we can't unpack those data and that evidence if there's not enough trust between those leaders. And Unfortunately, creating trust takes time, it takes effort, uh, but with willingness and with collective willingness, I think we, we can get there. So I'm really excited to be embarking on that uh, journey towards industry determined contributions uh, pre-COP26. Thank you, Faustine. 
trust, data, and leadership. Let me let me turn it over to the leadership. We are incredibly fortunate as a community of industry participants to have two unbelievable leaders who have made it their mission to help private sector engage with the UNFCCC and with the COP process. And um, they, they are a, a, a central point for a lot of the work that needs to come together in creating these industry determined contributions. So allow me to turn it over to my dear friends, uh, Nigel Topping and Carlos, uh, uh, Nigel uh, Gonzalo Munoz uh, from Chile. Gentlemen, over to you. Gonzalo, maybe I'll just say something about this this session. I, I'm, uh, Jules, I was expecting ahead, you please. to bring to bring me in. You obviously had a different um, script from me, and then then we're going to close off the whole the whole industry day. Which is what Gonzalo and I are going to do. I just wanted to come in and just to sort of put a, a parenthesis around the conversation that we, we just had. Um, I think this is a very exciting time for for this work. You know, we're talking about collaboratively defining uh, whole sectoral transition maps in sectors that historically have never done this. It's actually very familiar in, it's so familiar in the technology that we don't even notice that when we talk about 4G, 5G, that's a sectoral roadmap, right? Which is pre-competitively um, agreed and then and then driven hard to create value for, for society and for, and for the whole sector. So it's very exciting to hear it. I'm, I'm really, really, you know, I learned a lot about this from my time on the on the Energy Transitions Commission. So I'm really thrilled that Faustine, um, the ETC and the World Economic Forum and RMI and, and Weaving Business now and have joined the, 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 the governance of Mission Possible. So I'm really delighted to see that. It's absolutely at the heart of what Gonzalo were uh, trying to do to bridge non-state actors and state actors. Um, so I'm um, delighted to hear about the really real specificity um, of actions in the short term, in the context of the long term, Austin. Um, and and I, I think, um, George, you picked a good one on shipping because it feels like one where there's uh, um, a lot of collective momentum coming together around some of those concrete plans, which which I think we all hope can encourage the IMO to um, get a dose of ambition um, ahead of their rather slow process. Um, so having, having, having said that, I think we should I'd just like to sort of wrap this session. Thank you, Jules. Um, um, and, and this, this, this great panel. And I'll hand over to Gonzalo now. We're going to start try and put a wrap on the whole day. We've just seen a whole series of these sessions. So, Gonzalo, over to you. Thanks so much, Nigel. And, uh, and, and thanks also um, for, for the session that we have just uh, heard about. And Jules, Jules uh, thanks, thanks for uh, the support that, uh, that you have given us the whole year. And, and, and I would like to start then also thanking the World Economic Forum, the Mission Possible Platform, the International Trade Union Confederation, uh, and all of our incredible partners for such an inspirational second day of these dialogues. Uh, we are really, really um, excited about everything that is that we're seeing in the dialogues. And, uh, and we understand that um, we must use this energy and the run up to COP to move forward on specific and very measurable net zero commitments in heavy industries and to accelerate the policy, energy and technology solutions needed to reach net zero by 2050. We, we know that hard to abate sectors and he heavy industry sectors account for up to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions. So today's session carries so much of that sense of urgency around the climate crisis. The, the good news is that reaching net zero carbon emissions from heavy industry and heavy duty transport sector is technically and financially absolutely possible to a cost of less of 0.5% of global GDP by 2050. And, and we also know, of course, that the cost of inaction not only surpasses that number, but inaction is simply unacceptable. So now that we know it is technically feasible with technologies that already exist or can reach commercial readiness with a continued investment. And today, the enthusiasm has been overwhelming from all different businesses and stakeholders committing to accelerating this transition. Um, so, so with that in mind, what, 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 what do you think about today, Nigel? Well, um, as, you, as most of you who know me now, I spent the first 20 years of my career in, in industry. So I, I love that we're getting into you know, real industries where real people make real things and moving around the world. 
Um, and I, I really laugh today because there's this, and this, this conversation just now is typified that there's a really strong sense of detailed collaborative efforts about how we get to net zero before 2050. Uh, earlier on, I was on a session with um, all the leading groups working in the fashion industry, so producers and brands, um, and they're all coming together to create a shared um, decarbonisation roadmap, very much in the way that Faustine's just described. Um, it looks like they can um, come together around driving 45% of emissions around those value chains by 2030. That's the UN um, Fashion Charter, also an organisation called Fashion Pack, could be as much as a third of the industry. There's a big interim target with some specific steps that can be taken at different parts of the value chain. Also, we're seeing um, the UK retail industry do a similar great job. They've come together around a, um, a roadmap to get to net zero by 2040, with all the stores and warehouses being net zero by 2030. Remember, of course, retail industry has the whole of industry in its value chain. Again, to Faustine's point about demand signals, so we hope that that can really help pull some of the demand signals for decarbonizing shipping and other forms of transport. Um, in the UK, of course, they have 67 million people in their customer base. It's, the, it's, it's a big chunk of the UK emissions. The British Retail Consortium's roadmap's now been supported by 60 retailers. That's just in one country. Uh, and actually, with um, we're, we're, so we're now exploring, rolling that kind of model out to other countries. Um, I also really enjoyed today the way that poetry is being uh, incorporated in the dialogues. Um, we had one yesterday with the World Health Organization. Um, we had the first U.S. National Youth Poet Laureate Amanda Gorman joining us today. We also had Nadir Godridge, CEO of the Indian chemicals company Godridge Industries, re repeat a poem he's already broadcast about um, carbon pricing. So we had some. Um, I, I'm looking to our colleagues from Maersk and uh, and Shell to up their creativity. That the the, the, the gauntlet that's been laid by one of India's major industrial corporations. Um, but I don't think that's compulsory as long as we get to zero. So I think it's been a really fantastic day of um, inspiration and really practical, concrete steps as we grapple with the really challenging, disruptive changes that every industry is facing now. Back to you, Gonzalo. I, I agree with that. Uh, it's really exciting. And um, I also love to see how getting to zero is becoming such a competitive race now uh, in this, uh, in this uh, race to zero. We said it during the opening of the day, claim, climate action will become a source of competitive advantage. And we have seen that spirit a lot reflected today. Uh, we have heard from new signatories to the Climate Pledge, which is a commitment to achieve net zero emissions 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement, and now has 11 signatories since the launch on June 5th, including now Mercedes-Benz, Siemens, Verizon, Infosys, and of course, Amazon. Uh, it's uh, and, and that's a great um, a, a great collaboration with global optimism. Uh, it's it's becoming so clear that that in order to be the leader of the pack, companies need to commit to going net zero earlier than 2050. That that's something that is starting to happen, right? And indeed, some companies are committing to it as early as 2030, or some of them have already achieved it. Uh, the CEO of Saab, Martin Linquist, uh, summed up this level of enthusiasm today when he said, we should stop talking and start acting across all stakeholders to work together and support good initiatives that support just industry transition. Uh, that that uh, invitation to act is something that we heard during the day and uh, many times, but it's not only a race that companies will win on their own. Must We must all learn from one another and share best practices, both in operation and across supply chains. That integration in the supply chain is also something that we have seen so many times being reflected. Uh, this is why it was so good to hear from Acelor Mittal talking about their effort to scale and promote green steel production and from Schneider Electric participating in Amazon's climate pledge to reach net zero one decade ahead of Paris. Uh, those are, again, companies that will help others also to achieve their own targets. We also heard from Clara de la Torre from the European Commission on how policymakers can and will provide the finance and support to enable businesses to move as fast as they can on this zero carbon pathway. Uh, this is where the ambition loop really helps action accelerate. For me, it was very exciting to hear from Lafarge Holzing, which is the first global building material company to sign up with intermediate targets for 2030, validated by the Science-Based Targets Initiative, who rightly 
said that the time is over for incremental action. We need a revolution. And revolution requires also magic. Uh, and, and we have seen a lot of magic happening during the dialogues. I would say there is a, a kind of magical ingredient uh, in, in the dialogues in the global climate action, and it's about radical collaboration. So when we think about magic and collaboration, yesterday you were very concerned about me being hungry, so you did some uh, magical exercises and, and gave me a banana through, through the camera that was amazing. Uh, so I would like now to give it back to you with an orange that might turn into something different when you receive it. So there you are. Oh, again, a banana. Um, back Thank to you, you then, my friend. Um, incredible uh, magic here on the Race to Zero Dialogues. Um, just to wrap, I think it's really clear that um, we have great momentum now. People realize this is a revolution that we have to um, go through to get to net zero. Um, we know um, from the data that we published earlier that we've already more than doubled net zero commitments during the pandemic with now over 1,500 businesses committed. Um, and of course, with the um, SME Climate Hub um, launched with uh, William Business, the International Chamber of Commerce um, and Exponential Roadmap, um, looking forward to tens or even hundreds of thousands. I think the ICC have a target of a million SMEs joining the race to zero with um, companies like IKEA and Unilever joining as supply chain leaders to really encourage that. Looking forward to many more companies making those commitments and many more cities as well. Again, another another great demand signal coming from cities. Um, um, and looking forward to all this fantastic work we've heard about today on heavy emitting industrial sectors. Um, coming together so that by the time we get to Glasgow, we can really be showing the world that this transition is underway. Um, I think the Chief Sustainability Officer of Mahindra Group put it really well this afternoon when he said that setting science-based targets makes environmental sense. That everything you need to do as a business to implement and reach them makes business sense. So we're really excited about the progress we've seen today from many parts of the world of industry, from retail and apparel to cement and shipping. Um, and across the entire value chains. Looking forward to tomorrow. We'll be taking a deeper dive into the world of transportation of all forms tomorrow. So some of the mission possible magic will be back with us tomorrow. Um, so until then, thank you everybody for all your participation, everything that you've shared today. And for those of you listening, everything that you've learned and that you're going to um, implement in your own value chain, in your own systems. Thank you everyone for watching and we look forward to joining you again and seeing you for day three of the Race to Zero Dialogues tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye.